Gwen Allen, and I teach art history here at San Francisco State, as, as most of you know. Um, and I want to thank you for coming to today's panel discussion, where we have several of the artists who are participating in the collage exhibition, the gallery, um, here to speak with us about their work and about the medium of collage more generally. And I'm going to introduce each of our guests separately right before they, um, they talk to us, so I'll save that. Um, and I want to first just give a brief introduction um, to the exhibition and to the technique of collage. Um, and then after the presentations, we'll be having a discussion um, with all of the panelists, and then we'll open things up to the audience if there's time. Um, All right, so, the, ter so the, the, um, the term collage comes from the French collet, literally to glue, since it usually involves gluing together different things, including found images, clippings, and found objects. And it was coined as an artistic technique in the early 20th century to refer to works like this, Pablo Picasso's um, Still Life with Chair Caning from 1912, and Hannah Hook's Cut with the Kitchen Knife Through the Beer Belly of the Weimar Republic from 1919, and these are two really classic examples from Cubism and Dada. Um, but outside of the context of modern art, if we look back further, um, there are many precedents for collage, for example, in advertising. So in the 19th century, um, as you can see in this advertisement for a revolver, which shows a woman in a nightie um, defending herself against an intruder, it says, ladies, don't argue with a burglar. And it's a kind of um, drawing that, that is advertising this gun, which is then collage. We have a kind of close-up of the gun, as well as the text being kind of collaged over that image. So it was seen as a very, um, or it was used as a really, as a, um, as a visual technique that could, you know, that would grab viewers' attention, that would, that would manipulate our attention in really compelling ways and make us want to buy guns for example, um, which were for sale everywhere, <laughs> according to this advertisement. Um, but we might also look back to even earlier art forms, some of the oldest art forms we know of, um, to be collages. And as I was thinking about this topic uh, this week, I was thinking or wondering if we might even consider something like um, cave paintings, prehistoric cave paintings, to be collages because of the way in which they um, for example, here, combined stenciled handprints along with images of animals, thereby kind of combining or appropriating a kind of found object, the hand or the print of the hand um, in the image. And in this sense, you know, this fundamental impulse to appropriate and combine things or images is in some ways as old as visual representation itself. And it's in this expanded sense of collage, less as a specific medium or set of materials than as a mode of representation or a signifying practice that I was really interested in kind of exploring in this exhibition. Um, you know, I was interested, I think, in the question, how, do, how does collage produce meaning, no matter what materials you're talking about? Um, and one of the more, to me, one of the most kind of compelling explanations of this is a 1982 article by the art historian Benjamin Buclo called Allegorical Procedures, Appropriation and Montage in Contemporary Art. And um, the title of the exhibition is itself appropriated uh, from this article. Um, and so Buchlo says, you know, from the very moment of its inception, it seems that the inventors of the strategy of montage were aware of its inherently allegorical nature. And he uses the term montage, but he's really referring to collage practices more generally. So most of us are probably familiar with the term allegory. Um, an allegory usually means when one thing stands for something else, and it's a kind of metaphor, something that has a larger symbolic meaning beyond the literal. For example, a story or a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. And within the visual arts, when we think of allegory, we might think of a work like this. This is. Um, Filipino Lippi's The Allegory of Music, and it shows a woman who's the muse Erato actually leading a swan by a golden leash. The swan is a symbol of music in this, um, in this image, in this painting. Um, 
which has to do with the fact that Apollo's swan allegedly sang before its death, hence the term swan song. But in any case, we have here an image that really means two things at once. It has a literal meaning, an image of a woman with a swan, and then it also is an image that represents music. And so there's a kind of layering of meaning that takes place within the single image where we, where we have more than one um, thing going on or more than one meaning. And likewise, it's in this sense, according to Buchlo, that collage is allegorical. It literally pastes one image on top of another, altering the context and significance of both, kind of recontextualizing or confis fragmenting and confiscating the image, giving it a new meaning, and yet it also retains something of its, own, of its, of its original meaning. And so like, a paint, like this painting, it means two things, or oftentimes more than two things at once, and, um, and there's a kind of tension between those two meanings. It, ne it never loses its original meaning, and yet it gains a new one. So that is um, just a little explanation of that term allegorical and why I wanted to use that as in, the, in the title of, the, um, of this exhibition. When most people think of collage, they might think of traditional cut and paste techniques. And there are, in fact, several examples of this in the show, including the Jada Feo and the Jess images. Um, but I also wanted to expand the notion of collage to consider other kinds of visual practices that rely on a kind of allegorical transformation of images and objects, including films and publications and three-dimensional work. And the artists on our panel today exemplify these diverse approaches to the collage medium. Um, so I'm going to now pass the podium on to, on to them so we can hear a little bit more about their practices and then we'll, um, and then we'll have a discussion with everyone. So I'm gonna, um, I want to introduce first Terry Burlier, um, who, introduced, who, sorry, who received her BFA from Miami University in Ohio and her MFA from the University of California, Davis. She has exhibited widely in both solo and group exhibitions, including the Contemporary Jewish Museum of San Francisco, Catherine Clark Gallery, Babel Gallery in Norway, and the San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery, to name just a few. Um, she was a recology artist in residence in 2011 to 12, and more recently was in residence at the Montalvo Art Center in Saratoga, California. Um, and she recently received tenure at Stanford University, where she teaches art. Hello, thanks for having me, Gwen, and it's great to be here. Um, so this is a picture from Recology San Francisco, otherwise known as The Dump. Um, and when I was thinking about this exhibition, um, I was thinking that maybe The Dump was the ultimate idea of a collage. Um, but I don't know if that was just me. But, um, I, but one thing that I did remember from when I was in residence there, um, talking to one of the workers, and um, this is the public disposal area. So it's not where the garbage trucks are dumping stuff, but where cars pulls up, pull up and drop off material. So it can be um, individuals uh, that live in San Francisco, or it can be construction work, you know, a construction company dumping off, dumping off things. Um, and what one of the workers said to me was, you learn a lot about what people throw away. And, um, and he had also, his job previous to working at the dump was he had worked at a supermarket. And so he said he'd learned so much about people between those two places, between what they put in their grocery cart and then what, what they throw away at the dump. And I just, I found it a very interesting way to think about it. <clears throat> um, what, one thing I didn't realize that they, that came to the dump was cement. But of course, everybody always over orders cement so that they can have matching whatever gray or whatever color cement um, for their road or driveway. Um, so Recology is constantly trying to reuse this material um, before it goes totally bad. Um, and one thing that struck me was um, a professor at Stanford 
was studying the waste in Palo Alto, and the statistics were saying, she said, this was like around 2010, that 40% of the landfill was from construction waste, and then another 40% of that 40% was cement alone and concrete. Um, and so, and it's a, a material I had never worked with, so it became of interest for me to see if I could do something with that. Um, and it was also, the image on the right is, I got to use a cement vibrator, so that was very exciting. <laughs> um, but this was the first piece I made there. Um, and at first it was a little bit of a joke. The, the, the artist in residence studio is about a block or two blocks from where the public disposal area, the first image I showed. And so um, all, all the artists have like their little grocery cart that they push all their materials back to the studio in. Um, and so one of my first ideas was to just kind of fill it with cement, um, sort of as a joke on that pr the actual process of acquiring the materials. Um, but I was also thinking about the, the weight that consumer culture has on both the individual and the environment. And then this, this, this photograph I liked because it was taken um, at Recology where they're constantly trying to use that mismatched colored cements, which I thought was this kind of beautiful patchwork in the background. <clears throat> um, and some pieces come with a built-in title. <clears throat> um, and then this piece is in the exhibition, um, and the, the, obviously the, the photo on the left is in process. And um, I, while I was there, I was reading this book called Garbage Land by Elizabeth Wright, and she was, uh, she's a writer based in New York, and she decided she was going to follow where all of her garbage went. And um, one of the stories, sort of side stories she tells, is visiting a, um, a dump in Columbia and learning that um, the birds would eat so much food from the landfill that they could no longer fly. And I was, this sort of horrifying image was stuck in my head, but I was also very excited because I had found this beautiful bird cage at the dump and I was, wanted to use it for something. Um, so I was able to fill it with cement. This one's called Flight Delayed. Um, here's a detail. And then this is a um, second piece I have in the exhibition. Um, this is the pan lid Gamelon 2. I've done a couple different um, versions of the pan lid. Uh, some of them you can play, some of them you can't. But it comes from a, I did the Peace Corps when I got out of undergrad. And um, I was sent to Jamaica. And they have a very homophobic saying there that's two pan lids can't meet. And I was like, well, what does that mean? <clears throat> and, um, and it was translated, Terry, two vaginas can't come together. Um, <laughs> and I thought this was hilarious. Um, so then, ever since then, I've collected pan lids because there's always mismatched pan lids in the thrift stores. And um, there's also, um, some of the sculptures um, are not sound-based. Well, I guess that some of them I used as sort of, I'd made like a hundred of these pan lid couples where I would couple them together and they became little speaker, they, I would have speakers inside them and they were like speaker housings. Um, and then as I was doing that, I started setting aside the ones that resonated really well and started turning them into sculptures that you could play. Um, let's see if I can do this. <clears throat> and let's see if, oh, it's so tiny. Oh no, he's all, well, it's all about the sound. So this is uh, Chris Froh a percussionist based in Davis. So this was about, uh, nope. this is just an excerpt from a, a longer 30 minute performance where the composer had invited me to, to uh, make sculpture specifically for Chris to play. 
Um, and so this was one of the three of them. <clears throat> And it's just a good excuse to work with him because he's totally amazing. And he, perf he performed at the opening, which I totally missed, unfortunately. Okay, let's see if we can switch back. Oh, perfect. <clears throat> um, and then this is the last piece I have in the exhibition, um, When Comes the Sun, which I made in 2012 while in residency um, in Norway. And um, and I was there in the month of June, so it was the first time I ever got to see 24, or experience 24-hour sun. Um, and so I wanted uh, everything that I did there to be made by the sun or powered by the sun. So I did uh, a couple series of cyanotypes, um, which you may know is you expose paper to the sun and it turns it this deep blue cyan color. Um, and then the sculpture I made um, was uh, it's solar powered and which is interesting here because it's not very sunny at, <laughs> um, which actually makes it a more interesting piece when it when I've showed it in the peninsula when it's like always sunny it's not as interesting um, but it plays here comes the sun by the Beatles and then the tempo will vary according to how much um, sun it's receiving or not receiving um, so it can sound really slow and pathetic or like a cassette kind of dying and then it can sound really manic like or punk rock and then sometimes it'll hit the sweet spot and if you're in the gallery for very long it's nice when, when you can kind of really you can literally hear a cloud go by because you'll hear a variation in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the tempo of the, the piece and I can play you a little clip of this to end, <clears throat> to give you an idea. Well, that one's a little bigger. stop it there so um, thank you um, okay Matt Matt Baruso uh, received his BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute and his MFA from Yale um, he taught at San Francisco Art Institute California College of the Arts and Stanford University and has exhibited at second floor projects the Mina Dresden Gallery, the Headland Center for the Arts, and Exile Projects in Berlin. His third solo exhibition at Stephen Wolf Gallery in San Francisco um, is currently on view there for, I think, about two more weeks. Um, so, Matt, Matt Baruso. Thanks. Um, I guess I just wanted to show some images from the show. Um, and the images in the show are all separate, but um, here we're, I, they're all sort of jammed together. Um, I'm also, as well as an artist, I'm a bookseller and a sort of book collector. And I realized at a certain point that the books were a big part of my art, so I, I started using them for my work. So I'm very interested in, I'm also really interested in stuff that people throw away. Um, I started working in books, buying storage lockers in New York at the, you know, that people had not paid their bills on and selling them at the flea market. So I also spent a lot of time going through people's old stuff, learning a sort of like a forensic reconstruction of people's lives through the things that they throw away. I'm very interested in that. So I read the allegorical um, procedures article, which I had been meaning to read for a really long time. And one of the things that I really liked about it was Martha Rossler says in it that instead of talking about collage, that she said something like we should just talk about like contradictions that like it's a, for her I guess it was a, and I thought this was sort of the same for me it's about putting things together that weren't really supposed to go together and then having them actually seem like they kind of go together so these are a lot of the things that, or maybe that seem like they go together these are a lot of the things that I'm interested in I take a lot from film and I'm especially interested in like 
the craft part of film where it's like they're making the special effects. Um, I use a lot from horror um, magazines that are, and interior design magazines. And I'm like, a, a lot of the stuff I show is just traditional collage made with glue and scissors. Um, I like the idea of this kind of craft, like these Afghans or the special effects and taking them and sort of putting them together in a way that you wouldn't expect. But I also am interested in the, the, these things as art that other people are making in a different context that when put in the context of a gallery or some other place can have a totally different meaning. But I'm interested in their art as well. I take a lot from music, record covers. Um, these are just the pieces that are in the show. And um, I'm very interested in the idea of chance in the work that I make. So not only the stuff that I find going through someone's storage locker, which I don't really do anymore, but I go to the flea market every weekend and I'm very interested in the things that I find the things that I'm looking for. I have a lot of things that I'm looking for running through my mind. And I'm, it's amazing how I can kind of somehow come up with these things just by accident. So it's sort of an accident, but not really an accident. Um, and I wanted to show, so those are all the images that were in the show here. And then I also briefly wanted to show a couple of these things. So when I was younger, I was in a punk rock band called Crucifix. And this was the original, this is like the only original for like a Xerox flyer that I still have. So basically all the art we made when we were like teenagers was this kind of collage art. And one of the things that I really like about uh, this kind of collage is how sort of democratic, it's just like anyone could make this, right? It's just a matter of like looking, and, and at the time when I was 14 or whatever, this was all we had, so we didn't have anything. But weirdly, you know, after studying art and studying painting and so on and so forth, um, it came back to, my work came back to this, like these kind of really simple things. I'm very interested in the idea of like the most, the maximum effect for kind of like the least amount of effort, you know, between what you need to do to put something together to make it happen. So this is more like the Xerox, um, you know, the Xerox version that we would all see. And this is like just made from like snapshots that we had or someone had taken of the band playing somewhere. So this is all from like the early 80s. And then I just wanted to show some of the things that I'm working on now. So I'm very interested in, I spent a long time only collecting two-dimensional things, right? Pictures, magazines, books, things that are sort of, you know, not that a book is two-dimensional, but flat things. Um, and eventually, because my studio was just filling up with too much stuff, eventually I, was, I became interested in the idea of like the physical world again, like I wanted to make three-dimensional things. And so some of the first things I started making were these magazines, which I would cut out the text blocks and lay out pictures over other tech, you know, other grids of other magazines. But then I liked the idea that they, that the, that the thing itself was, was the final end result. Like the photograph had somehow come back into being like three dimensional in some way. And so the show, this is from the show that's at Stevens now. I think something like this is kind of how I'm thinking of it. Part of it is a print, part of it is a collage. The collage is sitting on top of something, hopefully, you know, talking a little bit more about its objectness, but also the idea of a sort of, you know, the, the way we perceive images and much of our visual world now is through the screen, like through it di digitally and, photo and photographically. So at least in the ways that I'm thinking about this in terms of layers, Photoshop, how things sit in front and bringing that into a more three-dimensional space. Um, and so this is another collage from that show. And then the final thing that I just wanted to show was this larger sculptural piece that's in the back um, at Stevens Gallery, which is really about sort of taking all these two-dimensional things and bringing them, making them into three dimensions. So this was much more about mold making and replicating and all the ideas that I would have in collage where I look for symmetry, um, doubles like the magazines, some of these things you can see in here 
or I'll collect many doubles of the same magazine or flipped sym symmetrical images. Um, I wanted to sort of take it into three dimensions, um, collect, you know, so things were, some of the things are just found, like that sculptural head, and then the, like the green head next to it is, I recast, I re-sculpted it and recast it, um, or the candle, things that were made as casts. But basically just sort of, I figured if I, one of the things that I was thinking was you either make the collage and then put it in a frame and the world kind of exists within that frame. But when it comes time to put it into a space where we all sort of move around in, that you have this whole extra frame to work with to make, to sort of for people to work in. And I'm just interested in how images and objects are sort of becoming they're sort of existing in a slippery space that, or an ambiguous space that is, is very, very dynamic and changing a lot. Um, and there's just a detail. So you can see the mirrors, you know, as replicating the image, um, the images, the real ear, the scan of the ear, the scan of the back of the ear. So just sort of working through all these ideas. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Um, and then next, Brody Ryman, um, who works collaboratively with Charlie Castaneda under the name Castaneda Ryman, um, received her BFA from Carnegie Mellon University and her MFA from um, UC Davis. And, um, they have had solo shows at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Bear Ridgeway Exhibition, Stephen Wirtz Gallery, and DCKT in New York. Um, Brody is currently on the faculty at UC Berkeley. Um. So um, what's been great, uh, just hearing two people so far, is I just there's so many threads that I feel um, that I felt in seeing the work in the show. And even now being able to hear people speak about it, um, I don't know, being, I thank Gwen for inviting us to be a part of this. And thinking about our work through collage, um, really we've never done, which, or maybe we have, I don't know, I got a little overwhelmed the last couple of days, one, reading that article, which I also wanted to read, never have, um, and at the same time thinking about our work and looking at images and trying to put together five minutes of collage, and um, so I'm really, I guess what I'm saying is I'm really excited um, to sort of think differently about how it's, I mean, I feel like everything is a collage now, and it's sort of like overwhelming me, and especially um, working in installation and layering and um, reproduction. And I mean, I guess it sounds stupid that I never really put this all together, and it always sort of fell under this installation umbrella, which now seems um, a little dated or something. So this is uh, the piece that we have in the show, which is um, we made on site for the show. And I think I'm gonna sort of come back around to it and talk a little bit, um, do a little glance at some other installations through the ages of ours to sort of talk about um, our practice and a little bit of the backstory of this piece. So um, this, this is from, I don't know, probably like 10 years ago or something. And, and I think this, I, the idea of layer, of bringing something forward in layer, and, and this, this work really was based more in thinking about structure and architecture and material and what it means to physic, like sort of think about what the site is, what the space is, whether that's you know, home or, or just architecture or building. 
sort of the stuff that surrounds us and how do you speak to that materially, while at the same time thinking about land, landscape and sort of what's outside being represented in. So it's sort of this a weird hybrid of all of that where all of the, um, it's also sort of a moment in our work where um, everything, all of the materials are, were really specific. Um, this coming after another moment in time where it was all sort of built out of construction materials, so there was nothing, um, it was all built to code and built with either drywall two by four, so the, all of the material and um, kind of standard language of building is how we built the work. And so this is a little past that where now we're introducing casts of um, concrete rocks, which are probably in the landfill right now, and porcelain rocks and um, all of the landscapes that, are, that seem to be landscapes here are actually drywall um, and drywall mud. So there's no paint. Um, on those pieces, <clears throat> and there's carpet that sort of layers on carpet that sort of, this, again, the idea of sort of layering was really important. Um, Charlie and I, too, are huge um, collectors and have a huge interest in things people throw away. Um, one particular collection is landscape paintings that we've um, have had for almost 25 years that have traveled across the country with us and kind of mm, are almost become souvenirs of places we live based on where we found them. Again, whether that's the dump or thrift stores or flea markets, kind of this interest in them as objects. This piece, another thing about using those then is is that we're just using the image of those and not the paintings themselves. So we photograph them and then reprint them. So they're all paper pieces. So the two, um, what look like, or three, what look like landscapes in this installation are actually paper, just sort of being very paper-like on the wall. And then there's also more um, cast porcelain and just kind of drywall, mantle-like shelf things. Another example of sort of just kind of moving forward and now using that imagery pulled from those landscapes and embedding it into, this, into sort of these fragments that are both landscape and also structure that we've rebuilt and created. Um, again, like, I don't know, I was, I was like, is this a collage? This was sort of my stretch image, like I wasn't really sure, but I think, it, I mean, why not at this point? And I, but I mean, the point being, like, I just got really, like, I couldn't stop looking at images and adding images and, and so, you know, paint, you know, first you have the wall, the gallery wall, which, um, we definitely consider like our paper or our main layer in, in terms of um, thinking about these projects. And then there's the paint, and then there's sort of the wood, but then the paint comes back on that wood. And, and I, um, yeah, okay, I, I think that's a collage. <laughs> and then there's this one, which is again similar, where it's, this was at, um, Yerba Buena, and the idea that the, that our interest, you know, again, was that these, these moments in this landscape sort of become fragmented, and this particular piece starts to become a, um, a remnant from a piece before that, that we reshot and put back into this land. So this, we sort of, at this point of getting, and I'll, move through this quickly because it's we're getting really about just reproducing and reproducing and and um i also want to wait let me start there. i also want to say that part of this um, process is 
all of these photographic prints are printed directly on drywall so that um, there's a printer, uh, Magnolia Editions, who we work with in Oakland, who we um, work with them to feed four foot by eight foot sheets of drywall through a printer. And um, so the idea that the image is physically on this part of the structure was really important. And that's also, um, uh, yeah, one of those panels is in the show here. This is um, when we really started to pull out all of our paintings. Then we started thinking of them as portraits and layering them in the studio and re-photographing them. And actually this piece, um, Matt's fork made me think a little bit more about this piece and I don't have an image, but then this piece was recreated in, this photograph was recreated in three dimensions um, and they sort of live together in the same space. This is just um, a C print of these paintings as objects that just sort of move through our studio and hang around and lean around and we started photographing them a lot. And then, then there's Photoshop, which is sort of coming at it like a 14-year-old doing collage, I would say, like a 40-year-old 40 40 person doing Photoshop is kind of what it, it's like, because neither Charlie and I know how to do it, or now we're better, but I think our interest in this was how do we take apart a landscape and look at its components of these paintings that we didn't even paint, but sort of examine how someone else painted them and and kind of mush all of that together about these paintings of these places that we had never even been to, um, and nor do we know who painted them, and sort of try to make our own sense of them while putting it through a digital program, which we knew nothing really about or how to do. But what came out of it was, I, I like the, the bad um, kind of clunky Photoshop-ness of them, and I actually like them a lot more than I do now sort of knowing a little bit more how to do Photoshop. Um, this is a fairly large piece. Um, it's about that, that wood um, found object is about 10 feet across. And then, the, so the print is about a five foot-ish by five foot print on paper. Um, of components pulled from the landscapes and then layered with paint and all sort of on top of each other. Um, this is just kind of a, a sketch of going through all of our landscapes and pulling, identifying what we thought would be subjects, this one being horizons. Um, we've done ground and water and sky and tree. Um, another example of the wall piece, which again, this is um, a pigment print, pigment print on drywall, and with drywall mud. So again, there's no there's no paint, and I th I think when you when this isn't in its digital form here, you really get a sense of that material, and ultimately it lives in this installation slash collage that we make. And, you, and it, it's part of these layers that I hope speak more to that materiality, which is um, really the important part. Another example. Um, okay, this is when I started to, to get lost. This is sort of a newer piece that now that idea of, of layering is the landscapes aren't, we're recreating these of they're photos of our sculptures that are of the porcelain, all that porcelain you saw, we re-photographed and like poorly put them in and tried to make these landscapes that are now from our sculptures. So the layering is sort of getting even deeper. And um, the piece that's in the show is starting with a new collection, which is these, um, paintings, pictures of paintings <laughs> that people take 
um, that are either like on a bed or in the middle of the street or leaning against a wall so that the image is sort of these portraits of a painting in a space. So if anyone has any of them in their collection, let us know. Um, and then thinking about how to work with those and this um, particular piece is part of the installation in here. That's it. Okay, and then finally, Matt Lips, who most of us know, um, received his BFA from California State University, Long Beach, and his MFA from University of California, Irvine. And he's had numerous solo exhibitions, including at Mark Selwyn Gallery in Los Angeles and Jessica Silverman Gallery in San Francisco, as well as Josh, Josh Lilly Gallery in London and has been included in group exhibitions at the Saatchi Gallery in London, Pier 24, ph um, Photography here in San Francisco, and the Foam Photography Museum in Amsterdam. Um, and Matt teaches here at San Francisco State. So hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm also a hoarder of images. I'm also looking back to the past and trying to make comments on the future. These are some threads I'm seeing. Um, I also make title slides that have my name on it. I also don't know how to control myself when making a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm gonna zip through half of this to get to the body of work that's actually in the show. So these are pictures that I would have talked about had I had all the time in the world. This is a cutout I made that was in my dorm room when I was like 18 of a um, CK1 ad. This is a picture of Claudia Schiffer. I was obsessed with fashion photography. This is the first picture that I ever remember taking of a picture um, that begins my whole process before I even knew what my process was. This was my thesis project when I came out. <laughs> I did a project on Ansel Adams, um, who is my, like, who I wanted to be. He was my ego ideal when I thought that um, that's what a fa uh, photographer was, an art photographer was. But what I want to get to is this which is the work in the show. Um, so I take pictures of pictures. You saw just a smattering of them flash past you. Um, uh, this body of work, this, the image in the show uh, to, uh, here is from the series called Library that I did. And it's um, based on the Time Life Library of Photography, um, which is seen here. Uh, it's a 17 volume set that came out in 1970. And it's at a moment when um, you know, Time Life, which was you know, circulating a lot of pictures, had a huge publication, was trying to capitalize on a moment when every family in the United States and beyond was getting their first single lens reflex cameras and setting up home dark rooms and really starting to grapple this grapple with this um, new apparatus of the camera and in order to document and take pictures and tell stories of their own lives. And Time Life wanted to make sure that you knew how to do that the right way. And wanted to make sure that you could actually make good pictures that would tell the story that people that could understand how to take a proper sunset picture, how to get the right picture of your child. Um, so they did a 17 volume set that was delivered to homes um, and you can see some of the titles here from uh, great photographers, the studio, color, travel photography. So it's covering different genres of photography in each book. Um, it is part instructional, so there's like diagrams of how your camera works and how chemistry functions. Um, and it was non-hierarchical, so it covered everything from fine art to home snapshots to um, studio commercial photography. Um, and this is sort of the series that introduces it, and I've highlighted some sections here. Um, there, there's a paradox in photography. It seems it is an artless art. A, even a child can do it. All of these things, like sort of some of these cliches that we sort of know about photography. But um, it's, it's interesting that we, I, I don't know that um, Time Life could have anticipated that photography would have infiltrated our lives to the extent that it has, that it, it mediates everything that we do, um, and that we all have smartphones probably in our pocket, and that we're all, we're all photographers and participating in images and Facebook and everything. Um, and it's interesting to think that 
we actually now sort of manufacture our life in order to create the images that we want to be able to capture so that we can keep them in our memory later on, that we actually produce events to make sure that we get the smiling happy birthday shot and that sort of thing. And it's because we become savvy to a certain degree with how pictures work and um, what makes for a good image, a legible image, um, that we can actually produce our life in order to create those sort of vignettes for us that we can have and share on Facebook, etc. Um, so I'm going to show you some process pictures here. I decided to make um, one picture for each volume in this in the series. So this is a picture of my studio, and each sort of half sec half shelf section there is um, one of the cutouts for the books. So I. I took the actual book series themselves and I, I start cutting out. I just sort of react to, as I'm sort of cruising through the pages, I have um, sort of a visceral reaction, response to certain images. There's, I have a sort of a, a broad knowledge of history photography, so there's certain images that I'm expecting to find in a book called art photography, and then there's some that I'm surprised to find. Um, but I just sort of, I don't really, I work very intuitively in my process, and I'm cutting out everything that I want to, and I mount them on cardboard I, using a lot of double stick tape, and then I stand them up on little props so they stand in three dimensions, and they're all staring at me. And as they land on the shelf, which is sort of an even playing uh, field, they start having their own conversations, which I think is really fascinating and interesting. And it's actually sort of a, a collage that works in three dimensions um, in that they, as they stand up, they sort of have different you know, size relationships in terms of how one relates to the other. And they become funny sometimes or obscene sometimes or very poignant at times. Um, so here's all the, the cardboard cutouts in the, the series. I did about 500 over the 17 pictures. Um, and they do sort of look like these cabinets of curiosity, um, sort of strange organization that doesn't really have an organization. It's very intuitive. Um, but it was actually this picture um, from 1854 uh, that sort of gave me an idea about I had all these figures, but I had no ground in which I wanted to rephotograph them. Um, Part of my practice that makes it distinct from collage proper, even though it's related to collage, is that rather than giving you the actual cutouts where you would see that they don't link up in real space, or if I had glued them down onto a background, you would actually be able to see the one layer floating in front of the other layer. Um, through the apparatus of photography, I take a picture and I lock them back under the photographic veneer, and it sort of sets them in a moment, in a space that tells about something that, that somebody that has set up these characters for you, but they don't necessarily look like different parts. They still look like a single whole, even though they're having different conversations across them. So, but I really like this setup um, of this photograph of just these glass objects on these glass shelves. So I decided to build something like that in the studio. Um, and you can see here's the cutouts, the black and white cutouts um, on a color field that's red. The background images from all the photographs are from my own hand process, 35 millimeter negatives. This one in particular is the book Studio. Um, and I went back through my 35 millimeter black and white negatives, the archive, and tried to find images that sort of spoke to whatever the topic of the book was for whatever picture I was making. Um, this one in particular is a very glamorous picture of my hand with silly putty fingernails. <laughs> um, the, for the studio book, which um, all of the images are very sexy and very um, slick and studio produced to elicit a feeling of desire, um, I went looking through my negatives to find out where my desire lies and I found this picture of like, this was something that I did, this was a hobby of like trying to make my hands look really fabulous and glamorous with lady fingernails, and I took that picture. And, I'm, and it's like, you know, I only took that picture because it was safe because I was going to process it myself and no one would see it ever. And I never printed it, but when I went, went back and I found it, I was so excited. So I took it into Photoshop and I colorized it and I pin it to the backdrop and then I set up my glass shelves and I set up the um, little figures in front of it and I take a picture. And so these are all of the cutouts that I cut out, or most of the cutouts that I cut out from the studio book from the series of Time Life images. Um, and then the image is just simply titled whatever the book title was, one word from the book title. So this one's Studio. This is the image that's actually in the show. Um, it's called Art. So it's, um, it, it was looking more at like fine art images. And um, it was interesting to see like from the photojournalism book, which had very tiny intricate, intricate pictures that had a lot of action. It's, when, I, when I cut them out and they stand up and I look at them, 
they seemed very spare and very singular large objects. And so it creates a totally different composition from something that has very small intricate cutouts. So this is, um, and then I went through and I did this today. I actually went and found all of the original images or all of them that I could. There was two that I couldn't find. Um, oops, sorry. There was two that I couldn't find, um, which for whatever reason, they, as artists, apparently they didn't make it into the world of Google. Um, but for the most part, everyone else did. You can see um, there's Imogene Cunningham up there. There's Bill Brandt. There's Edward Weston. And I just sort of respond to different things and follow intuitively the process with my X-Acto blade cutting them out. And this is what the final image ended up looking like. So and I thought this was really fun. I'm probably the only one, but <laughs> I wanted to show you that. Here's some other pictures from the um, set. Oh, yeah, I, the background image is a, my first 4 by 5 negative that I hand processed, which was me trying to be an art photographer, letting go of my 35 millimeter Pentax K1000 and trying to do 4 by 5 lar large format um, imagery. Um, this is from the book How to Photograph Children. Um, the background, the only picture of children I had were little doll children from a uh, family, doll family that I took pictures of. This is the photojournalism image, which is about photography as much as it is about history, or it's actually, it's about history seen through the apparatus of photography and pictures that we know and have a similar sort of history to, um, and they're a little bit unlocked from their traditional space, and it gets you sort of to see them again for the first time, because you might see something that you recognize, you'll think it's a picture, and for all intents and purposes, it may be whatever picture it is that you conjure, that you bring to it, because it's in that genre of photography. Again, because of the savviness of how we're able to read images and how quickly we consume them and the, the, the collective history that is, is bound up in it. Uh, this is a nature photography. Travel. Um, travel was interesting because even in the 70s, it was, it's very much about like, you know, taking your camera to these exotic places and looking at the other and clicking it and then taking it back. And they kind of work like Google images. If you, go to, if you were to go to Google and you typed in travel photography and clicked on image, you would see images that are shockingly similar to this still to this day. Um, this is one of the books was called The Great Themes of Photography. Uh, the great themes of photography boil down to war photography, the nude, still life, portraiture, and the everyday. And there were so many good pictures that I had cut out that I couldn't put them all into one single picture, so I ended up making a diptych. Um, the image in the background is I was a, a in, when I was 19, I worked at a Mexican food restaurant. I was a host, and my co-host, she wanted to be a Victoria's Secret model, and she's like, you're a photographer, right? And I'm like, sure. She wanted me to take pictures of her, and I was like, well, take your clothes off and get on a ladder, because that's what you do. Because <laughs> there was a way of working, you know, when I, was, when I started making photographs, it was, it was a very informal process for me. It wasn't as critical. I was actually, you know, riffing off the grand masters of photography. Um, so this is actually my Irving Penn. There's a famous Irving Penn photograph where he has 12 of the most photographed models on two different sets of ladders. So I, I copied it. So I was working in appropriation before I knew what it was. Um, and then the last image here, after the 17 book series uh, ended, they started doing like a best of photography starting in 1973 and only went to 74 and 75. So I made a giant triptych. Um, the background image is um, my Irving pen of cigarette butts on the ground. Um, and it's 73, 74, and 75 in one, one year per panel. Uh, and that's my last image. I think I did that really quick. Did I? Okay, cool.